four minutes to air. Ollie, get your butt to the piano bench. What are you wearing, you nut? Hello, Mr. Wilder. Well, hello, Bertha. How are you? Darling, save your charm for the audience. It's not me you need to impress. <laughs> My apologies. No need. Mr. Wilder, I came here to give you one last chance to say no to the show today. Well, I don't mean to be rude, but why would you? Well, I do it as a courtesy to all of my guests. You see, most don't fully grasp what the outcome of this really means until it's too late. Yes. Well, I don't have the slightest intention of backing out, madam. I may be dead, but I am no coward. <laughs> well, all right then. Head down the hall to the waiting room, and I'll see you out there. Good luck. Well, luck is for the foolish, Bernadette, and I am no fool. <laughs> Two minutes to air. <laughs> Mrs. Wilder. Oh, please, call me Constance, or Miss Lloyd, if you prefer. Oh, not a problem. You wish to speak with me? Yes, I do, Miss Lloyd. I want to be absolutely sure that you're aware that once the cameras start rolling, there is no going back, and no topic is off the table. Do you still wish to continue? One minute to air. I have to. I am ready to move on. Well, hopefully, at the end of today, you will. So head over to the wing, and I'll announce you out like we rehearsed, okay? Okay. Yes. Oh, and Constance. 30 seconds. Yes. Yeah. Breathe. Okay. Excuse me, your tissue. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, and welcome to Clear the Air, the show where the deceased have one last opportunity to cross over into the next life. So please put your hands together for the host of Clear the Air, your favorite and mine, the lovely Bernadette Davies! Oh, hello! Hello, everybody! Look at you! So glad you all could come! We've got a hell of a show tonight! We've got a hell of a show tonight! Second banana, Ollie Fisher. We've got a hell of a show tonight. We've got a hell of a show tonight. There is no finer form of recreating. Kick back, relax, and view. If there's stiff competition. Please give the devil his due. We've got a hell of a show tonight. We'll go above and below tonight. Will the angels sing or sing? And how with laughter will they save us all? Or give him what he's after? Watch the fires of Hades ignite. They will reap what they sow. Watch the joy and the woe. It's a hell of a show. Bernadette, I could be better. Oh, why is that? Well, I could still be alive. <laughs> you slay me. Uh, in all seriousness, though, this is a very special edition of Clear the Air. A celebrity edition, if you will, which is probably why you are all here to see it. And we are anxious to get started. 
Now, most of you are familiar with our show's process, but for those of you who are new to purgatory, here's how it works. You are here because you need redemption of some kind. If found ready, you will ascend to a place of eternal peace. If not, you will descend. And I guess you all know what that means. Life is a very serious game, and the afterlife is no different. Isn't that right, Holly? Uh, you aren't kidding, Bernadette. <laughs> you got that <laughs> right. Well, as I was saying, this is a special edition of Clear the Air. Constance Lloyd and Oscar Wilde were the toast of the Victorian society. He, a controversial novelist, poet, and in-demand playwright. She, a successful children's book author and a women's rights supporter. Together they were pioneers in the industries of fashion and home decor. They were the world's first it couple. But at the height of their celebrity, a vicious scandal shook their seemingly concrete foundation. And the house beautiful that the two had so proudly built together came crumbling to the ground, piece by disgraced piece. Now, they are here tonight to clear the air and hopefully find that bit of redemption each was unable to find among the ruins at the end of their lives. So, let's give a big clear the air welcome to our first guest, Constance Lloyd. <laughs> Perfectly fine. <laughs> Darling, you are shaking like a chihuahua. What's the matter? I am not used to being in front of a crowd in this manner. I, I apologize. Well, there's no need to be sorry. I know this is all a bit intimidating, but everyone is here to support you in this transition. Am I right? Yeah? Let's show her we care. Give her another hand. <laughs> Feel better? Quite, thank you. This is a very unfamiliar position for me to be in. Well, this is your moment, and a very big moment. And you were the one who notified us that you were ready to go forward with the process of crossing over, right? Yes. So I think the big question on everybody's mind is, why? Why now? Well, as you may know, I have been dead for more than 115 years. 115 years? And I thought those poor people from the Titanic held a grudge. <laughs> I still had so many questions. Mm. I tried to come up with ways to answer them on my own, but found myself conflicted. Why is that? I do not wish to be a burden to anyone. I decided that I need absolution. I desperately want to be liberated from my past and the source of my pain. Mm. Your show is the only way to do that. And that source of pain you are referring to is your husband, Oscar Wilde? Yes. For those of you who neither can't remember or have never taken a high school English class, Oscar Wilde penned such literary classics as The Picture of Dorian Gray and the plays An Ideal Husband and The Importance of Being Earnest. What was it like living with such a famous man? We shall find out. <laughs> Are you ready to see him? Never and always. All right, let's give a big clear the air welcome to our next guest, Mr. Oscar Wilde. <laughs> the infamous Mr. Wilde. Oh, please, dear, call me Oscar. Look at all of you, what a wonderful looking audience. <laughs> It's been a while since you've been in front of such an adoring crowd, right? It has been a while since I've had such a warm reception. Thank you so much. And you are just a vision in that outfit, is she not? <laughs> <laughs> and what about this beautiful creature on my right? Now, I was talking to you, Ollie. Oh. <laughs> and Constance, of course. Oscar, stop it. He's a charmer, isn't he? <laughs> He's something. <laughs> so nice that you agreed to be with us, Oscar. Well, it is about time, wouldn't you say? Yes, I would. 115 years is a very long time. Indeed. 
Have you two talked to each other since landing here in Purgatory? We have not spoken a word to one another since we died. Wow. A hundred and fifteen years without communicating. At all? Why is that? I could not bring myself to it, nor did he ever try. So, Oscar, the question of the day is, why now? Well, when I received your cordial invitation, letting me know that Constance had made the decision to cross over, it made me think, well, why have I not made that leap yet and I rightly decided to join? Mm. Besides, purgatory is so dull, it's as if I'm in a production of Hamlet and everyone is playing Hamlet. <laughs> and I also have to say, this is the first time that we have had two crossovers in the same show. Oh, would you say this is your first double cross? <laughs> <laughs> Can't get anything past you, can we? So, Constance, Oscar, are you ready to begin? Let's. Please. All right. I would like to start at the beginning. How you two met. Constance, can you take us there? Yes. <laughs> Back. Where are we? At my grandmother's house. My family is having one of their social tea parties. I am keeping to myself. I generally do not like large gatherings, but I insisted on coming today. Why is that? Word was that Oscar Wilde was planning to attend. It was a pretense that he meet my sweet cousin, but after he arrived, he hardly left my side. What did you talk about? Not the usual small talk one would expect. We spoke of our distaste for polite conversation and discovered our mutual appreciation for certain writers and artists. He even offered to get me a drink. While he was away, I somehow gathered up the courage to tell him I had been following his career in the papers for some time. I had an immediate attraction to everything about him. I was determined to make him mine. rather than talked and could actually stay with me in a conversation. It was new, but it was what I knew I had always wanted. I'm smitten with lust. Oh, I'm smitten, I must trust this fear will never subside. I'm a blaze in his glow. It sounds crazy, I know, but I picture the woman my bride. Marvelous man, he 
like no one before. She's all I could ever hope for. I just met the most fabulous. We shall start for us. I just met the most fabulous, fabulous keep the relationship going. We would write to each other practically every day. Oh, what kind of letters? No, oh, they were the type of sentimental letters that two people in love would generally write to each other. Oscar would write me the most beautiful letters. Do you still have any of them? Oh, well, no. The house we lived in was robbed, and I'm not sure what became of them. Well, just so happens that one of them was recovered, and uh, I have a copy. Oh, right here. Good Lord. <laughs> Oscar, would you be a darling and read it for us? No, I think not. Oh, we'd all love to hear it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I do apologize, but I would feel most uncomfortable. You know, an, an artist hearing his own work and all. Would you mind if I? If you must. Dear and beloved, here am I and you at the Antipodes. Oh, execrable facts that keep our lips from kissing, though our souls are one. What can I tell you by letter? Alas, nothing that I would tell you. The messages of the gods to each other travel not by pen and ink, and indeed your bodily presence here would not make you more real. For I feel your fingers in my hair and your cheek brushing mine. The air is full of the music of your voice. My soul and body seem no longer mine, but mingled in some exquisite ecstasy with yours. I feel incomplete without you. Ever and ever yours, Oscar. Rubbish, really. <laughs> it's actually quite lovely. Well, yes, I suppose it is, thank you. Uh, Constance, did you feel as incomplete without Oscar? Yes, if not more so. I remember one night I missed him so much I cried myself to sleep. I never wanted to be away from him. A man always wants to be a woman's first love, and a woman always wants to be a man's last romance. Was she yours? In a manner of speaking, yes. <coughs> what would you say was the biggest obstacle in those early years? Oh, the distance, I would say. Well, whenever he had an opportunity, he would visit. One night I came calling in a white horse-drawn carriage. Do you remember that? I do. We made laps around the park just talking. It was such a beautiful night. We never made it to dinner. <laughs> Only grand gestures of love, you know. You always had the best taste. Well, we kept the love alive in our hearts. A life without love is like a sunless garden when the flowers are dead. Can a loveless life be that bleak? Yes, it can. Hmm. Well, I'd like to move on now to discussing the early projects for which the two of you were celebrated and admired. Your uh, pioneering of the home decor and wearable fashions of the aesthetic movement. Mm -hmm. I'd like to start with the former. Constance? Oh, the idea for the house beautiful came from Oscar. He had the p most beautiful design ideas for the interior of our own home on Tite Street. Uh, you, you, you must understand that the Victorian era led towards a very stiff and suffocating style. I wanted to infuse color and character into the home. Give it its own life. I see the homeowner as an artist, and, and the interior of the home as a canvas upon which that artist should paint something beautiful. So why do you think that appealed to people of the times? It was a projection of oneself. Unless you were an artist, be that a painter or an actor or a writer, true self-expression was generally not an encouraged practice. Exactly. So then, like, Home decor, fashion was also a strong personal statement. Oh, absolutely. Especially for women. The style was so constricting and oftentimes hazardous to one's health with all of the layers and corsets. If a woman were to inherit a cough, she ran the risk of cracking a rib. Mm -hmm. 
asked us was there something else besides the need for more practical clothing that made you want to drive this part of the movement forward? Oh, well, it was actually Oscar's passion for it. It was. Could you elaborate on that? Wait, better yet, show us. Well, that is perfectly fine with me if you want to. Oh, I am not certain I have a choice. <laughs> and pick out or design the clothing I would wear. When a dressmaker came for a fitting, whatever Oscar was working on for the day, he would set aside and devote his complete attention to me. He checked every stitch at every seam and watched how the fabric moved with my body. I had only seen this kind of passion from him when he was writing, but this kind was different. And it was all for me. I have a passion for fashion. I suppose I've a nose for the clothes that will make you look best. devotions to women well dressed. A female has natural beauty. Her God-given figure is grand. Loose fitting attire is required for the chores she has planned. Women's clothes have <laughs> you two really have a strong connection. Have. Have. Not in that way anymore, of course not. But we do have a connection. Even you cannot disagree with that. I suppose you are right. Constance, can you elaborate for our sake about that connection? Well, besides the aesthetic movement, our close friends and the public often mentioned that we were an excellent match intellectually. I could usually keep up with Oscar in every topic. Try to, anyway. Yeah, I am a hard person to keep up with in a conversation. 
Most days I am so clever I do not understand a single word I am saying. <laughs> I've only known you for about 20 minutes and I could have told you that. Oscar, your ego is very divisive. Wouldn't you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not certain that I would yes, say... It is. Oh, apparently so. From uh, what I've researched, people either adored you or despised you. Whether it was the style changes you were at the forefront of or your literary works, public opinion was always split about you. Why do you think that's so? We aren't holding anything back, correct? <laughs> not if you're hoping to cross over. Well, I have this saying. Experience is the name that we give our mistakes. And I have had quite a lot of experience. But what I can conclude from it all is this. I simply do not care. Trying to act respectable has never been easy. It only made me see the tall and the expectable. While others mind their P's and Q's, I embrace excesses. Never mind the messes. I ignore the don'ts and do's. Even the luckiest gambler knows that a streak won't last. is not the only perspective that does not lead to peace in the end. None of them really do. There is this feeling of indestructibility that one has in their youth. That feeling changes drastically when entering one's prime. When reflecting back upon all that has been said and done, regret for our mistakes is the one thing that we see all so clearly. One's hindsight is always perfect. And what is it now that you see so clearly as regret? What was not? <laughs> Do you avoid every question directed towards you? I answer the questions, darling. It may not be the answer you're looking for, but I do answer them. You do not answer the questions. You swerve gracefully around them. Oh, well, I will take that as a nasty, backhanded compliment. Thank you. Oscar, I am not trying to be snide. No, you really are quite skilled at it. <laughs> okay, okay, I can see we're getting into some of the conflicts of this relationship. It's a good time for a word from our sponsor. <laughs> fresh jawbone of an ass and put out his hand and seized it and with it 
He slew a thousand men. Amen. Thank you. In case you've just joined us, this is Clear the Air, and our special guests today are Constance Lloyd and Oscar Wilde. Constance, I want to get back on track here. Since um, Oscar had made it clear that he had adopted this I do what I want and I answer to nobody philosophy of life, I'm curious to know, what was yours? Oh, how Better yet, why don't you show us? I, no, I do, I do not think Constance, that Constance, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you're an introvert, right? I suppose so. Right. Well, you've never had the chance to tell your side of the story. Don't you think it's time to let it out? Well... Wouldn't you like to see that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Good. When I was growing up, I found this little piece of advice. Qui patitur vincit. Translated from the Latin motto, it means, he who conquers endures. It struck a very resounding chord with me. To clarify, if I may. You may. It is not so much about winning, but rather finding the will to continue. That is part of the whole meaning. One must find the strength and courage to continue, that is true, but the ultimate goal of finding that determination must be to conquer one's obstacle. Would you say that you're an optimist, Constance? I try to be. Mm -hmm. 
Growing up in my family was not easy. My father was too busy pursuing other women to mind his responsibilities to his family. My mother had always been a difficult woman, but after my father died, she became a nightmare. With my brother away at school, she took all of her anger out on me. How? In every way possible. You never told me this. I never told anyone. There comes a time when one must decide if one will be the victim or the victor of one's circumstances. And then? Ah, qui patitur vincit? Yes. I have to say, I never thought of you as this strong-willed. Oh, she is. Everything within her brews inside. But when that resoluteness comes out, she cannot be stopped. You seem to admire that. Oh, I did. Still do, really. It was one of the things about her that I always loved. And hated. I know this is kind of abrupt, but uh, Constance, since you're talking about your home life, I thought it might be a good time to talk about the kids. Oh, of course. Constance, by all means. Take us there. Where are we? And when? In the nursery of our home. It is a few days after the baby is born. He is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. It's a boy. He has his papa's eyes. It's a boy. It comes as no surprise that he's charming. His smile disarming. With a twinkle like that of his father. It's a
I have a son, it's a boy. Cyril was a delightful child. Pleasant, even-tempered, affectionate. We were so happy. And yet, you had another child. Well, I had planted the idea of trying for a little girl. A daughter to buy dolls for. And play dress up with. It would have made our family complete. However, we were not prepared for the alternative outcome. It's a boy. I have a son. Just like the one before. It's a boy. I'm Sun. We'd hope for something more. Days of waiting, anticipating. All our planning seems hardly worth the bother. was the name you christened your second son, right? And yet you didn't officially name him until several days later. Why is that? Oh, well, that is true. Well, that sounds remarkably uncaring. Why didn't you? We had invested so much of our energy into our expectations of delivering a girl that we had no other names selected. Mm. How did the two boys compare growing up? Cyril was a joy. He was the ideal child that every parent wanted. Vivian was quite often sick and required constant attention. So we go from jubilant celebration with Cyril to reserved disappointment with Vivian. What happened? Well, it, it was a number of things, actually. Like? Well, you see, we... We were starting to... Um, well, there was uh, this. If either of you could start to form a complete sentence, that would be great. The, the truth of the matter was, we were we were going through some financial difficulties. Oh, at Oscar. The, what? Constance, was, what is it? It was not just our finances. Well, our finances were one of the yes, reasons. Yes, one of the reasons. What about the others? As I was saying. Oscar, please do not disregard me. I think I liked you better quiet. <laughs> Things are uh, <laughs> sizzling now. What do you do to beat the heat? Quench that unquenchable thirst with Tantalus Dry fruit sodas. Tantalus Dry, a name that has not been trusted for over two millennia. But on those hot Hades days, damn, it tastes so good. Try the tangy taste of Tantalus Dry fruit sodas within easy reach at your local 7-Eleven. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Constance, why don't you tell us what changed with Vivian's birth? It was the beginning of the end of our relationship. Uh, there is no need to be so melodramatic. It is the truth, is it not? He completely lost interest in me throughout the second pregnancy. Mm -hmm. He would not touch me, let alone look at me. Most nights, he would either shut himself up in his study... I had just been hired as the head of a major magazine publication. Or he would be out drinking with his friends and admirers. Fraternizing with colleagues and possible future employees was one of the unwritten requirements for that job. And furthermore, who's to say that one cannot have little fun in doing so? Men 
were not born to break rocks in the sun, nor made to be mules under torrential skies. Our purest pursuit is leisure and fun. There's no honest job. What a pack of lies. When you're lashed to the yoke like jackasses, work is the curse of the drink. So the working man's lifestyle wasn't suiting you? Well, how could it suit anyone? So many different rules being put into effect by just as many different superiors. It was enough to make one apoplectic. Men are not creatures of cautious restraint. Not our nature to ration nor measure. Bow to the bust of Bacchus our saint. Work is the curse of the drinking classes. Not all men are as carefree as you were, Oscar. Some were responsible for me. Responsible or imprisoned. Here's to the boys who have made the mistake of rising at dawn to tend to their farms. Now here's to the boys who stay to Take. Now all take a turn at bending your arm. We will empty the cord as it passes. Work is the curse of the drinking classes. family as a trap? Well, there were days I felt that way, certainly. I think you would be hard-pressed to find any parent who at some point or another hasn't felt confined by their familial duties. Even I did. Thank you. See, and everyone regarded her as mother of the century. <laughs> now, the magazine that I was publishing for, A Woman's World, was my first steadily paying job. I did not want to make a mess of it. I was relentlessly scouting new talent. If that meant frequenting a few pubs, then so be it. I wanted to be surrounded by the best team possible. I was not considered one of the best. I meant for work. But we collaborated on this publication, did we not? I proofread the articles for you and even submitted some work of my own as well. Permit me to rephrase then. I wanted to be around people who weren't constantly reminding me of my responsibilities. <laughs> Since you, Oscar, wanted to get away from the family with this work, and all of this unhappiness started after the birth of Vivian, did you two blame him for this downward spiral? No. Never. Uh, my not wanting to be home was not caused by him, but the motivation had been there for some time. Did you love them both equally? Yes, of course. I'm not sure if I believe you. It is the truth. Vivian came at a difficult time, but we loved them both equally. Cyril knew this. I do not think Vivian knew. Do you regret that? Every day. So now, Oscar was throwing himself into his work and late night partying, and you were with the children. Did you have any escape or hobby going on? Anything else for you other than the glamour of diaper duty? Well, yes. I was working on my first children's book, which did quite well. I was also very invested in the Women's Liberation Foundation. Well, for those of us who may not be familiar, what is that foundation? Well, we were a group of women who wanted to become more involved in the male-dominated world of politics. We wanted to be recognized as more than just homemakers. Which in that time was regarded as taboo. Precisely. There was one other organization you were involved in, uh, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. That silly club. It was not silly, Oscar. What attracted you to this society? I had always had an interest in what could not be easily explained by practical science. The order was a sanctuary to gain understanding about the metaphysical world. The metaphysical world? That's something we're familiar with. You also dabbled in Christianity and Catholicism later on, did you not? 
I did. She essentially shook hands with every spiritual association available. Never knew why. Oscar, who's the host here? <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I did not mean to overstep. <laughs> of course you didn't. So, Constance, why grasp at all of these religious straws? I did not want to be narrow-minded. Hmm. Or did you think maybe I should just cover all of my spiritual bases? That it was better to be safe than sorry? There it is. Well, you would think if that was the truth, that one of them would have been right, and I would not be stuck here still having to deal with him. Oh, and I chose to be here, as if I wanted to sit here and listen to you whine for all eternity. Do any of us choose to be here? Do you think I want to sit here and listen to them whine for all eternity? <coughs> They say that uh, hell is a road paved with good intentions. Well, I don't know about all that, but I do know that it is paved. I was a bright, ambitious girl and not adverse to study. Though I was not a vicious girl, my ethics could be muddy. I could have picked an honest trade. Instead, I practiced law. <laughs> For all the money that I made, my cold heart couldn't thaw. I screwed my partners, screwed my clients, helpless widows, corporate giants. No one ever made much of a fuss till one day I was thrown under a bus quite literally mm, yuck it's funny how life changes when you die too late to make amends or even try but as they laid me in the earth I started to repent and wonder where the hell I might be sent. I guess I got that right. Yeah. Soon I won't need a sweater Cause it's 
Sure. <laughs> okay. Continue. Okay. From what we've heard so far, your second pregnancy caused Oscar to lose sexual interest in you and that he was out all the time, correct? Not all the time. Yes. Surely, there must have been some speculation about this. Oh, what do you mean? <laughs> Playing coy now, are we? I'm talking about rumors. <laughs> you two were the most talked about couple of the times. Everyone wanted to know what was going on in your lives. You were a media sensation, sort of like the Victorian Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. I have no idea who they are. Uh, well, no need, no mind. Uh, so what were some of the rumors? Well, there was less about me, as I recall. Yes, that's true. I was the one at the butt of every joke. <laughs> what kind of jokes? Come on, kids, give us the dirt. There was talk of... Constance, may I? It was all about me, anyway. <laughs> People began to say that... Began to? They had been saying this for years before I even knew you. What were people saying? Being a public figure, I was always scrutinized. But being a public figure in the arts makes you all the more susceptible to every type of ridicule. People are strange that way. Whenever someone is pouring out their heart in a self-expressing medium, they become immediate targets for the harshest criticisms imaginable. Artists pour out their hearts to share their human experience only to be stabbed by sharp critical tongues. But I suppose most of us take it that way because we become so defensive of our work. Although true, Oscar, <laughs> what were the rumors about? <laughs> because of being involved in... He was alluded to as... As a dandy. A dandy? <laughs> a dandy? <laughs> so the... Public was <coughs> poking fun at your masculinity? Yes, but it was to be expected. When a man heads a campaign to change the style of an era, it becomes comedic material ripe for picking. I never understood the obsession with the public. I was married with two wonderful boys. That should have been the end of discussion. Well, from that technical mm. standpoint, yes. But uh, did you ever confront him about uh, this gossip or his being away? I did. What would happen? When Oscar did come home, it was only to pack up whatever items he needed for his next trip. He never said a word except for where he was going and when he might be back. Might be back. He made that long walk from the bedroom to the front door, each footstep pounding in my heart like a drum. And with each step, each resounding step, a new fear entered into my mind. Boom. Is this the last time I am going to see you? Boom. Are you leaving us for good? Boom. Are all of the things I have been hearing about you true? One day, the pounding in my chest became too great to hold in. I told Oscar to turn and look at me. I have some questions that I need you to answer. Please speak directly and don't breathe like a dancer. Say 
Thank you. 